Did the week eight film show Taylor Heineke being a potential upgrade for the Falcons at quarterback? And I'll also explain why the team stood pat and didn't add that big time edge rusher at this year's trade deadline. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. All right, everyone, you know, welcome back to an illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Falcons is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So, you know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman. AKA Sirius Black, AKA Mr. Drew, AKA Mr. I Told You So. But guys, I want to give a special shout out to all the everydayers out there that make this illustrious podcast their first listen each and every day, first watch as well. And all you have to do to become an everydayer so that you can be told, I told you so. Is to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to get the latest episode as soon as it's available. So today we'll talk later about the trade deadline and the inaction of the Falcons today on Tuesday. Obviously, they made a move on Monday to get Contavious Street. Um, we'll talk about why the Falcons stood pat, much to the chagrin of Falcon fans across the world. Uh, we'll talk later about the defensive's struggles in in good and bad, I guess, from the defense in this Titans game. Uh, but we'll start off talking about the quarterback dilemma that the Falcons have to deal with. And having watched the all 22 now of this week eight game against the Titans and, and looking at what Devin Ritter did in the first half and comparing it to what Taylor Heineke did in the second half, you know, my opinion going into Sunday was basically looking at Taylor Heineke's body of work in Washington over the last two years is that it's his play there is very similar to what Desmond Ritter's play has been through the first seven and a half games of this season. Inconsistency, but a smattering of competent quarterback play that is going to allow your offense to function if the pieces around him work, uh, and a high degree, a higher than desired degree of turnover worthy play. And after watching the film of this Titans game, I saw nothing that would lead me to change that assessment of Taylor Heineke. Um, and, you know, I say that knowing it's a small sample size, knowing that Taylor Heineke played in this game, coming off the bench, basically cold, having not really done anything in the last two months, barely getting any practice time and really not playing any uh, games. So I'm not going to be too judgmental over that. I'm not going to sit here and say, Taylor Heineke stink. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just sitting here saying like, that was my, my general impression of Taylor Heineke was one thing. I didn't see anything in this game to cause me to, you know, change my mind on that. And, you know, I think the thing that really stood out to me in this game related to the fact that Taylor Heineke came into this game cold and, and inactive for like two months is that the Falcons kind of called the game the way that you would want them to call it in the third quarter, especially compared to how they called it in the first quarter to deal with a quarterback that was dealing with it. That was a much more balanced offense that was relying heavily on their, their run game to move the ball rather than letting asking their quarterback to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And that's exactly what you would want to do, you know, given Taylor Heineke's situation going into this game. And it, you know, it was sort of the idea of like easing him in the game and let the run run game do most of the work, which was a big contributing factor to those, um, you know, field goals in the third quarter. And, you know, we just need you to make a couple of throws, Taylor Heineke, and we'll be fine. And that's kind of what the Falcons did, right? And that leads me to wondering why don't the Falcons just do that with Desmond Ritter? Why didn't they do that against, against Tennessee in the first half of this game? And I'm sure some of you guys, many of you who have commented on previous episodes of this podcast and say, Aaron, I've been, we've been saying that all year long. And every single time we talk about Arthur Smith calling, you know, too much passes or, or whatever, you sit here and you come on the podcast and you defend Arthur Smith. And I would say, yeah, you're right. Right. I have, I, I think I will defend my defense <laughs> by saying, I think the context 
was different in those situations, right? I defended Arthur Smith's pass heavy approach against Detroit and Jacksonville because I think the goal was to try to get your young, unproven quarterback into a rhythm. It didn't really work in those games, and I understood the criticism of it, right? But I think it was understandable why they were pushing for that. And I thought their pass heavy approach against Washington a couple of weeks ago in that loss was mostly due to Washington shutting down the run game early, and they basically had to pivot to, you know, throwing the ball more. Tennessee, at least in the early going, although the Falcons didn't run the ball a ton. So again, you're you're dealing with a small sample size, but Tennessee wasn't really shutting down the run game. And so I don't think the pass heavy game plan, or at least I this pass heavy game plan that the Falcons had with Ritter in the game is as defensible as it was in those previous weeks, right? And so I'm not even putting forth the idea that Arthur Smith's poor play calling cost the Falcons a game. It was absolutely a complete team loss, right? Play calling may have contributed to the loss, but the Falcons lost this game in all three phases. They got outplayed in all three phases. So sitting here being like, hey, Arthur Smith should have ran three more run plays, you know, in the first 15 snaps. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that would have won them the game, right? They needed to make a lot more plays in order to win this game than changing, you know, three passes to runs. But the point more is that as we sit here and focus on the quarterback and understandably we focus on the quarterback because that's just the nature of this sport and the quarterbacks get all the blame. They get all the, the praise is it's all about the quarterback. Right. But I feel like the Falcons issues go beyond the quarterback because I feel like the Falcons aren't playing with the identity or the brand or whatever you want to call it a football that they're basically built to play the, the promise of, you know, at least the sell job I was trying to do on this podcast all off season long is like, I'm going to sell you on, this is how it can work. And we get halfway through the season and, and the Falcons outside of two, maybe three games, haven't really played to that style, to that brand, to that identity. Right. And I think the Tennessee showed you exactly what that brand is supposed to look like on Sunday. As I mentioned in the postcast, uh, in the rapid reaction, right. It was run the football, play good defense and Hey, quarterback, we just need you to make a couple of throws. And we'll win this game. Right. And so, you know, if Arthur Smith wants to sit here and change the quarterback moving forward, because he's, you know, he's over the Desmond Ritter experiment, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. That's his prerogative. But I sit here and I go until you can get back to playing the Falcons brand of football. I don't think it's going to matter who the quarterback is, guys. Now, if it was up to me and it's not. But if it was up to me, I'd probably start Desmond Ritter this week, as I said on yesterday's episode with our guest, Corey Woodruff. I would hope that he can rebound at home against a relatively weaker opponent in Minnesota. Although I, I don't think the Falcons, you know, no no, no game is going to be a pushover for the, this Falcon team, given how they're playing this year. And then you get in the next week, another road game, but probably the quote unquote easiest road game that you should have this season against Arizona. Although today's news indicates that that should be Kyler Murray's first game back, right? But the reason why Arizona is a relative softball is not because of their quarterback situation is simply because they have one of the worst defenses in the NFL. And so again, whoever's the starting quarterback for that game should be able to put their best, one of their better foots forward, even if it is on the road. And then after that, you go into the bye week you do all the self scouting, you do all the adjustments that, you know, you need to do in the bye week as all teams do. And then you come out in week 12 and you kick the Saints butt. That's how I dream it up. That's what I want to see happen. But as I said earlier, it's not up to me to make that choice. That's up to Arthur Smith. And so if tomorrow we're doing this podcast, this daily illustrious podcast, and we'll know by then who's going to be the starting quarterback this weekend against the Vikings, Heineke, Ritter. You know, and if Arthur Smith chooses that to be Taylor Heineke, so be it. I'll understand why he he did that, right? But I'll continue to reiterate moving forward, whether we're talking about Heineke as a quarterback or Ritter as a quarterback, that I don't think swapping out the quarterback is going to change the fact that your offensive line got their butts kicked in the trenches on Sunday. That swapping out the quarterback is not going to change the fact that your, your defense got punked by D Derrick Henry and your secondary played with bad technique and, and gave up four explosive touchdowns in this game. So for me, the Falcons problems go beyond the quarterback, but understanding that the quarterback gets all the oxygen in the room. So we'll see what choice Arthur Smith makes tomorrow. And we'll talk about it on the podcast. 
continuing on today's episode of the podcast, we'll talk about the Falcons in action at the trade deadline and why they were inactive at the trade deadline. And a uh, spoiler alert, it's because money. And we'll get into exactly what I mean by that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. So our partners over at eBay Motors teamed up with Locked on Fantasy football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. And whether you're prepping for your daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you with players that are guaranteed to fit your roster. So let's see who Vinny has picked out for us in this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And we're going to go with Drake London, you know, guy close to my heart. So Vinny, I appreciate you for giving the Falcons some love in, in some of these recent weeks. Drake London, relatively quiet week eight performance against the Titan secondary. Only caught five passes for 55 yards, but he should get back on track against a vulnerable Viking secondary in week nine. You know, there's a potential quarterback change, which we were talking about looming, right? Possibly the Taylor Heineke. And if that's the case, maybe the Falcons will have a more effective downfield passing game that will allow Drake London to get some of that high volume and high explosive plays that can help him out in fantasy. And now that Vinny Iyer has helped us out in fantasy and help us get one step closer to winning our fantasy championship, eBay Motors knows that a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. And the same is true with your vehicle with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly, whether you're looking for brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time with your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash, baby. And I'm the type of person that, you know, if you want me to do anything that revolves me getting under the hood with my car, man, it ain't for me. But I love that eBay Motors has for, you know, the car agnostic folks like me, you know, the interior stuff. That's so I, I, I can handle an interior. I can get nice seat covers. I can get new cup holders. I can get all that stuff. And I can do all that to keep my ride or die alive over at ebaymotors.com ebay guaranteed fit it's only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply so let's talk about the lack of moves at the trade deadline of course the falcons traded yesterday for Kentavious street but uh, they did not make any moves today which uh, we were waiting to see if that would happen and i'm sure i could go back to a previous episode over the last week or two and clip out a segment where i basically said you know, Mr. I told you so. Where I was like, I don't think the Falcons are going to make a splash at edge, but they're much more likely to make a low key interior D line move like Contavious Street. Uh, and of course, that did come to fruition. But of course, all that time for weeks, if not months, there has been buzz building among the Falcon fan base and media folks that, you know, maybe they need to make a big splash at edge because that has been an obvious area of mediocrity, let's say, for the Falcons this year. And so without them making that big splash at edge ahead of today's trade uh, at 4 p.m. Tuesday, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Tuesday, you know, I think this led understandably to a lot of disappointment, especially when it came to two edge rushers got traded today, Montez Sweat and Chase Young. If you didn't hear, Montez Sweat was traded from the Washington Commanders to the Chicago Bears for a second round pick. And Chase Young was traded from the Washington Commanders to the 49ers for a third round pick. And so clearly Washington seems to me, at least from my perspective, check out Locked On Commanders for more insight here. But at least if I can put on my David Harrison, you know, we both wear glasses. We both have a beard, you know, we're both bald. OK, that's weird. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this. Um, You know. It seems like Washington is collecting assets for their next regime that's very likely to take over this offseason. But again, Locked On Commanders probably has better insights than I do. Um. But, I, you know, it begs the question, why didn't the Falcons make these specific moves? Why didn't they offer up what Chicago or what, or San Francisco or more than what these teams offered up for these two guys? And I think the focus tends to be on the draft pick compensation. Oh, we could have we could have offered more. We could have given a first round pick to outbid the Bears. We could have given a second round pick to outbid the 49ers. But I think the reason why the Falcons didn't get these make these trades happen is nothing to do with their unwillingness to give up draft pick compensation. It's about money. And this goes back to the exact same conversation. I could probably clip this out as well. Going back to an episode we did in June when we talked about the possibility of trading for Daniel Hunter. And I basically said, 
I don't think it's likely that the Falcons are going to make this trade, whether it was from Daniel Hunter when he was being talked about and rumored about back in June or any of these trades that have been rumored and discussed for the last you know week or so. Because I don't think the Falcons want to fork up the contract that would ju- would justify their decision to trade for these guys, to give up the assets, right? That's where the draft assets matter. It's like, okay, you gave up this asset in order to justify giving away you know, a potential starter, long-term starter in the draft. You need to make this guy a long-term starter. And with Montez Sweat and Chase Young being in pending free agents, you're not renting these guys for nine games. Now, 49ers might be renting Chase Young for nine games. They're in the relatively unique situation where with a team with Super Bowl aspirations, having extra assets, they're uh, projected to get two extra third round picks and compensatory picks. So having three third round picks, they could afford to give one of those away. Um, and because they're, you know, trying to get over the hump to get into the Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl now, as opposed to later, you know, they don't necessarily have, they, they essentially could be renting Chase Young for nine games. Although I, I do think the possibility of paying Chase Young after the season is, is definitely a possibility if they, kind of reshuffle their D-line, which I think they'll probably will wind up doing, but we'll we'll see. Again, Locked On 49ers is probably the better place to go for that type of insight. But here's where I, I'll say, I'm not an agent, but if I was consulting the representation of both Chase Young and, and Montez Sweat after these trades, I would be like, I'm not going to take a penny less than $20 million a year. Because you look at the franchise tag according to overthecap.com that's projected next year, for both of these guys, if they make it to the end of the season and don't get that long-term deal, franchise tag is going to be $20 million. And so I sit here, if I'm going like, I'm going to get $20 million if I do nothing. So I'm going to do nothing until you offer up 20 plus million dollars a year. And I don't think personally, either player is really worth that type of money, but at least theoretically, Chase Young is more possible because he's young enough that he can continue to improve. Um, I, I kind of think Montez Sweat is who he is. But as I said back in June, you know, it's not really about the player in terms of paying them when it comes to the Falcons. It's about the person, right? The Falcons play the person, not the player. Um, And I know there's a lot of people that are going to dislike that approach, but it is what it is, right? Because all you got to do is look at who the Falcons have paid, who their four biggest contracts currently on the roster are. Chris Lindstrom, Jake Matthews, Grady Jarrett, Jesse Bates. Four captains. Right. And this is not to suggest that Chase Young or Montez Sweat are bad guys or whatever. But I think the Falcons approach is that if we're going to fork up that type of money, we want a cornerstone face of the franchise type of player. And I don't think they were prepared to make either one of these two guys that guy or any of these edge rushers that they've been rumored or suggested to be going after. And maybe they won't ever be willing to, you know, do that for that player. And as I said, I think, you know, you can criticize this team because I think you can make a pretty compelling argument that their best chance of getting that sort of alpha, that sort of Batman, whatever you want to call it, type of edge rusher, um, their best chance of getting that was today at the trade deadline versus waiting a few months and waiting to the offseason, right? You know, maybe you get another bite at the Chase Young Apple, depending on what happens with San Francisco, but... Rashawn Gary's off the market. Nick Bosa's off the market. Brian Burns is probably almost certainly going to be off the market. You know, Montez Sweat's now probably going to be off the market. And so the market's looking pretty thin when you're looking at potential free agents that the Falcons could sign that sort of fit their type. Is a bunch of 30-year-old guys, Daniel Hunters, you know, Jadavion Clowney, Zedaria Smith, you know, the one sort of young player is like AJ Epinesa, you know. Only Hunter is the sort of a Batman type of guy. And, you know, how many more years is he going to be that guy? That's the question, right? And then you look at the draft. There's a lot of good prospects available in the draft, but, you know, the Falcons like, you know, bigger DNs, bigger edges, right? And there aren't that many of those guys that have that type of upside, at least sitting here today. Again, we'll see it's the whole process. But sitting here today, there aren't too many of those guys that look like they can be that sort of Batman that are going to be available in the draft. But at the same time, you know, I'm not convinced that the Falcons are that desperate for the alpha edge that it's as big a priority for the Falcons as it is to, I think, a lot of fans. And, you know, my buddy Jarvis. You know, I think Ryan Nielsen's proclivities are that he'd rather have a strong eight-man rotation than just having four monsters 
you know, at the top, right? It's, it's, you know, and it's early, it's October. So this is not a final determination, but it makes me believe that the Falcons will prefer a more bottom up approach to building their defensive line, building up a deep rotation versus a top down approach, which is let's get the four best pass rushers out there and then worry about the depth and rotation later. And again, I think it's fair to be critical of that approach. I'm sure Jarvis will have some thoughts on it later this week. And I'm not even here to say it's the right approach. You know, time will tell if that approach works out in their favor. So, you know, I'm a patient man. We'll cross that bridge. We won't get to it. But let me make this clear before we move on and talk about the defense in this Titans game. I'm not saying that the Falcons made the right choice by not pulling the trigger on these trades. All I'm saying is the Falcons made a choice. And I'm just giving you the reasons why I think they made that choice. And had they made a different choice trading for these guys, I'd be on this podcast explaining to you the reasons why they made that choice, because that's basically what my job is. I certainly think that they would be a better team today if they had made one of these trades. But I don't think it's as simple as some people will portray it as, which is, you know, not trading for one of these guys means you want to win. Not trading for these guys means you don't want to win. You don't care about making the playoffs, all that stuff. Again, that that to me is emotions. That's not, you know, logic and reason, right? That fuels those types of takes, right? And I certainly understand that upgrading the pass rush seems like it's going to be even a bigger priority given Grady Jarrett's season-ending injury. I agree. But I also tend to think that that playoff push is not contingent on the Falcons' pass rush being upgraded. As I've said several times on this podcast, you know, we don't really have the schedule where I think needing an elite pass. Again, not saying that we don't need a pass rush, but having a pass rush is, is, is not good. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying like, you look at you want to have a pass rush when you're facing top shelf quarterbacks. We don't really face any top shelf quarterbacks. So the next, the you know Kyler Murray, Derek Carr, that's it. You know, like those are the best quarterbacks we face in the rest of the season. Baker Mayfield, oh, you know, like so. Like I, I don't know if like it's like oh no, we don't have a pass rush. We're gonna you know now next year when we're facing Patrick Mahomes and. Jalen Hurts and Dak Prescott, like it's going to be a bigger priority. But I don't feel like it's like everything hinges on it. This is basically what I'm saying. This season, you know, I tend to think that this team's ability to make the playoffs is contingent on their offense being better than what it is right now. And right now their offense is basically below average, if not bottom 10, bottom five, and pretty much every offensive metric that you can find outside of the run game. And even then they're only average in terms of the run game. And so I don't feel like, you know, I feel like that's a bigger obstacle for this team making the playoffs than not having Chase Young, not having Montez Sweat. So, you know, not to mention, you know, I've long been a proponent that, you know, Chase Young is overrated, but, you know, the brand is strong. The brand is strong. But anyway, uh, you know, if he succeeds in, in San Francisco, I'll be like, it's Bosa. It's always been Bosa. But we'll see how that all plays out for them. And we'll wrap up today's episode talking about the defensive issues against the Tennessee Titans. Coming up. So don't worry about buying tickets to your next event because Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, comedy, and theater near you with killer last minute deals, all in prices, and views from your seat and their best price guarantee. Game Time is taking the guesswork out of buying tickets. It's the only app that gives you peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat before you buy so that you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices mean that you're not going to be hit with hidden fees. You can buy tickets in two taps right up to the started event and game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If your tickets, if you find tickets in the same section or row for less, game time will credit you 110% the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So we'll quickly wrap up just sharing my thoughts watching the film, given that this was the worst defensive performance of the season for the Falcons and some of the things that stood out to me watching it, you know, and I doubt this was a factor in why the Falcons did not make a trade, but I did think charting the, this game that this was the best the Falcons pass rush had been all season long, that PFF had the Falcons pressuring Will Levis on about 42% of his dropbacks this week. My charting had them pressuring on about 45% of his dropbacks on the 15 plays where I had the Falcons getting pressure. Levis was only successful on two of those 
15 plays. Uh, now, one of those two plays happened to be the fourth quarter touchdown to Nick Westbrook and Keeney, where Tequan Graham had a quarterback hit on that play, and that was the touchdown where Jesse Bates got beat, mostly due to poor technique. And I think all these touchdowns, all four of those touchdowns that Levis threw were mostly due to poor technique on the part of uh, one of their defenders. Uh, A.J. Terrell less so on the first one. You know, I think he's much more forgivable, but Jesse Bates on the one and and Richie Grant on, on two of them, right? He wasn't responsible for giving up uh, the 16 yard touchdown to Hopkins, the second one, I think it was. Um, that was Nate Landman who got beaten that coverage, but Richie could have potentially prevented that touchdown if he had better technique on that play. But um, what was interesting in this game in particular, the Falcons played a lot more cover three. Um, and, you know, the re- reason for that was because they wanted to get that eighth defender in the box to better stop the run. Falcons chose not to play man coverage in this game really much at all. Um, and typically you see that against inexperienced quarterbacks like a Will Levis in this game, because man coverage means that those guys are going to throw in the tighter windows. And that's something that young quarterbacks tend to struggle in this league. We've talked about a, a bunch with like Desmond Ritter and, and all that stuff. So you've heard that before. And my best guess is why the Falcons chose not to play, um, man coverage was because they wanted their deep defensive backs to not have to turn their back. And so that they could keep their eyes forward so that if they needed to contribute to run support, they could. Right. Um, and that uh, to me is kind of what's most disappointing about this game is the the Falcons had a game plan. And like, we're going to gear up to stop the run basically, which my best guess is, is what describes your game plan. And they didn't stop the run. Like Derek Henry, you know, had a field day against them. Right. And he was very effective running the football. And again, that's, that's what makes Derek Henry, Derek Henry and, you know, potentially a Hall of Fame running back, although it's going to be challenging for Hall of Fame, for running backs to get in the Hall of Fame, given how much the league has changed in the last couple of years. But if anybody's going to be the exception to that rule, I think Derrick Henry is one of the guys that is deserving of that. Uh, in in the modern day NFL, Christian McCaffrey, Nick Chubb, probably also in that conversation. But again, that's a separate conversation. So, you know, Derrick Henry doing Derrick Henry things. But that's what, to me, was disappointing about this guy. I, like, I don't even think Will Levis played all that well. I just think he made a couple of throws. And they all happen to be touchdowns, right? It was just like, and again, I, I think a lot of that had to do with the Falcons' poor technique or whatever on those particular plays. Maybe, maybe the, the defensive backs didn't respect Will Levis enough or the Titans' receivers enough, uh, and they didn't, they weren't on their P's and Q's in this game to the degree that they needed to be. And you know, again, I, I don't have an explanation for it, but that to me is sort of the story of um, this game. The Falcons wanted to play a certain style of defense; it didn't work is basically what happened in this game. And that was a little shocking to me because that has not really been the case for this defense. So I would like to believe that it was just an off day. We'll see, you know, if we have more games like this in the last nine games, then we'll know that, you know, whatever mojo that this defense had, you know, started to run out, but we'll we'll just sort of have to see how that goes. Hopefully they'll they'll have a rebound game against a rookie, another rookie quarterback in Jaron Hall. Um, Hopefully, you know, Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson won't do the things that DeAndre Hopkins and even Traylon Burks had his his moments in this game. Um, but hopefully, you know, they'll be better prepared for that. So um, we'll see how, how it goes for the Falcon team. Tomorrow we'll be back with a crossover Thursday where Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings is going to be joining us. If you're interested in seeing many of the plays, that I'm talking about on today's episode, including some of those touchdowns, some of those defensive breakdowns. We'll also look at some plays um, from both Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter, good and bad from those guys. You can check that out on the extended all 22 review, which you can get access to if you become a Locked On Falcons insider. The link to join is in the description below. That's joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Falcons. It's a 14-day free trial. Then it's $4.99 a month after that. Not only do you get access to that extended all 22, get break extended breakdowns of these plays in crisp HD video. Uh, you also get that one-on-one communication. So you can ask questions, you can give me feedback, you can, you know, get, you know, feedback on your Halloween costumes or your Thanksgiving recipes, you know, whatever you want, you have that access to me. So uh, make sure you hit the link in the description below. That's going to do it for us here, guys. Continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen. Check out Lockdown NFL as your second listen. It's all part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.